I'm Claire Edwards, and you're listening to Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today, I bring you a conversation from the olden days, that is, pre-COVID-19, with Marcus von Fucht. He's a principal consultant and partner with PricewaterhouseCoopers here in Sydney, Australia. Marcus is passionate about ensuring that everyone knows how they contribute to individual and team success, whatever that may look like. And this comes through in the form of his consistent messaging around providing context, testing assumptions, and seeking first to understand. Enjoy this podcast about the enabling leader. Like other guests on the Authentic Leadership podcast, I've yet to meet Marcus von Furcht in person. And I was recently having dinner with my business partner and her friend, telling the friend about the podcast when she said, you have to interview Marcus. He's a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers and definitely a great candidate for the Authentic brand. And so we connected. As you're aware, each podcast comes with a category. And having chatted with Marcus and read his biography, we agreed on The Enabling Leader. So I'm excited to sit back, to listen, to trust and enjoy where this conversation might flow and find out more about the importance of enablement in 21st century leadership. Marcus, welcome to Authentic Leadership. Oh, thank you, Claire. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, I'm really, I'm really, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So, you know, as much as I am keen to jump straight into the topic of enabling others, I'd love for you to share a little bit of your career to date and what some of the key influences have been for you along the way. Okay, interesting question. Um, My very first role was with a, a small office equipment company where I went out and supported the computing needs of small business. And at the time, I I didn't appreciate it then, but I appreciate it now, that really understanding what your clients' clients need Mm. um, is really important, particularly small business where, you know, if something wasn't working, then, um, you know, they couldn't couldn't actually operate their business. And so I learned very quickly to really – focus on that client support that, uh, and end user engagement and really trying to understand not only what my immediate client needs were, but also what their clients yeah. needed for them to operate. And that was probably before the whole sort of stakeholder engagement, you know, understanding along the whole supply chain, whatever no, everybody this, this needed. Was trial and error. Yeah, this was trial and error. <laughs> You, know, you don't always get it right, but uh, you learn very quickly, particularly where people are very dependent on, on what you need and where you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got to focus on what's priority. And, yep. and it does change very quickly. And you've got to be agile to, uh, to respond to those. And was that so, so you sort of developed that as a practice of philosophy of value. Is that something that stayed with you the whole way through your career and into leadership? Uh, always. Um, and you know, I've been I've been around quite a long time, and you know, I'm a partner at PwC. Um, I'm on a number of boards, and it's always important to seek to understand what people what people's needs are, and, and how do we best position ourselves to understand that, so we can reflect and and respond to those needs more effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's very frustrating, you know. And, and coming from a technology background, you see it a lot where people have technical speak and people have business speak. And, yeah. and the reality is there is no such thing as technical speak because what I learned is very different to what is being applied today. So, but I still understand what you know, our real clients need uh, across a number of industries. Uh, mm. It's really important to understand the context in which you're working. Absolutely. And so with... With this, this sort of deeper understanding of uh, of the wider implications and and that that real active listening, learning to speak your client's language and your client's client's language, tell me where enablement came in because from the little that I know of you and have read about you, you're pretty passionate about it. it it's it's something that I've really developed over 
you know, over a long period of time. One of my earlier roles, I, I was asked to go and um, undertake an assignment uh, on behalf of a consulting firm you know, for a government department in Canberra on a piece of technology that I had no idea about dealing with, um, with embassies around the world. Now, this is pre-internet, so, you know, connections are very different. Um, access of it is, was very different. Um, and on my handover day, uh, I was told, well, your team will come in tomorrow and uh, you just need to tell them what to do. <laughs> and I was a, a young, early 20s, worked in technology, and all of a sudden I had a team of, I think it was uh, nine or ten people who on the following day were expected expecting me to do and tell them what they needed to do. And I, I learned very quickly that, you know, I don't know what everybody does to the same degree that they do. You know, people are experts in their own particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I have my own understanding of what that might be, but the reality of applying it to a particular situation uh, hit home pretty quickly because I couldn't do everything. And uh, for, for those listeners, there's a, there's a fantastic book um, called uh, by David Marquette um, talking about his experience in taking on a uh, he was captain of a nuclear submarine in the US Navy it's called uh, Turn the Ship Around he, he found very quickly as well I mean this is a much more a broader and more important role that um, as a captain of a ship people were just looking at him to tell them what to do and, and he too learned that the reality is that you can't be an expert in everything and you yeah. have to rely on the expertise others to actually get something done and you know the the more senior you become and the larger the teams that you have you can't do it all you've got to rely on the, on the well-being of others and, and as a leader I've learned that you know my my challenge is in explaining the context in which we operate you know, answer the why yeah. uh, managers can tell you the how and the what um, but people need to understand the context in which they operate and and that's the driver Wow. Oh, there's quite a few things um, coming out for me there. I, I'd, I'd love to go back to, so you're in this situation, you're working for the, or contracted to the government department in Canberra, all these embassies, you're in your early 20s, you're given this team. What were some of the mistakes that you made that helped you develop even further? What were some, what were some of your stuff ups? There must have been a couple early on. Um, lots, and then they continue today. <laughs> um, I think it's um, assuming a level of knowledge and understanding in the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. uh, so testing assumptions is really important. Um, you, know, you, you expect people to operate at a certain level um, and if that doesn't happen, you, know, you end up with um, errors or, or issues that you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. So I think testing those assumptions about what people know and, and the game that they're playing is really important. Yeah. Um, and that was, I think, the biggest learning and, and probably the biggest error that I made because you're, you're assuming about, you know, people's roles in a team and, uh, you, you know, you're assigning tasks and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden you find that a person, you know, takes every Thursday off because they were driving a cab in Canberra, um, ah. which was quite a different <laughs> mindset, you know, as a, what you're expected uh, in a normal team or a normal project that you, you weren't aware of before. So just the availability of resources and where people were at in their own uh, cycle of life, how they wanted to work, all those sorts of things. That That's interesting because it links in with um, another interview I did recently around diversity and inclusion. And the woman I was speaking to said, she just gave a simple example of, um, you're coming into work, it's, it's raining really, really heavily, so you decide to, uh, as a manager, you decide to take the car and, you know, use the car park, and then somebody comes in 10 minutes late, and you just say, so, you know, you're late. But then without, you know, what you say about testing assumptions, that person took three buses to get there and mm. came in soaked because of the rain. So I think that real... And it is a classic leadership quality of slowing down your thinking, you know, before we, because we know that we have this quick system in our brain that just wants to jump to conclusions and make assumptions and often unintentionally, but 
we end up judging. And I see you you do a lot of work at, at PwC today around that well-being and diversity and inclusion. So I'm really curious as to how you help leaders to do that sort of slowing down of thinking and and widening their scope of um, I suppose seek first to understand, which is what you started with. Yeah, no, it's 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 key. Um, it's interesting when you when you sit down with somebody and you say nothing and you just look at them, things do slow down. Mm. You know, people are very uncomfortable in silence and seek to fill it very quickly, as you say. Uh, and I think learning to appreciate silence is important as a leader. You don't have to be the voice. Mm. Uh, you've got to let others bring their voice to the table and their opinions. Uh, and I think one of the challenges I always, I've always put to my managers is, you know, you can bring as many problems as you like. Uh, that, that's, what I'm, that's what we're here for. But bring some solutions to the table as well. Yeah. So at least you've thought about where you're at and, and what you're doing. And then, you know, in those conversations, you can use the silence to explore what those options might be and give people space and time to think about what it is they need to do does it make sense? As you say, we, we all jump in and we get into the detail. We try and resolve every issue there and then. And sometimes it, it just doesn't pay. Uh, mm. We just need to give ourselves time to, uh, to move forward. Yeah, really, really good point. So, you, so it sounds like early on that you realised that as a, as a manager or, or leader of people, you realised that, you know, you couldn't be the answer to everything. And I think that looking at that changing face of 21st century leadership where it's, you know, the, 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 the military term VUCA, the volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous is now coming into play in business where we have business disruptors who are not your typical competitors. In your experience of, of working with leaders, you know, both inside and outside of PwC, do you see a change, Marcus? Are you seeing leaders now realizing, you know, I don't have the answer, but collectively we can arrive at it? Oh, very much so. I, I think the awareness around a VUCA environment is very much top of mind uh, at senior leaders. The world has gotten so complex and the issues are all so interconnected that you've got to rely on expertise that, that you yourself don't have. Um, I think it's one of my, my other things that I've always done is, is lifelong learning. And so I've gone back to uni a number of times and I've done a number of short courses around various issues, mm -hmm. topics. And you, I think you need to know enough to be able to ask questions of people so mm -hmm. they have trust in what you say that you know a little bit about their environment, but you're seeking to understand more. Uh, so that gives that interconnected um, trust that you need between people yeah that otherwise you wouldn't you, you know, it, it'd be nonsensical for me to say well i know everything about a certain topic if i don't because you'll get caught out very quickly yeah particularly when there are issues and complexities that that are all interlinked that need, need resolution so um, and I yeah, think no, definitely i think the awareness is there for people to uh to understand and, and really seek input and guidance across a wide network of people and expertise to come to options and come to solutions. Yeah, actually, that's the, the, that's a really interesting point because just today I read about um, the CEO of LinkedIn is stepping down in order to focus on network diversity. And so what they realized was that in the referral system that they had, they were, you know, they were getting more of the same people from the same background and the same sort of tertiary education and what have you. And, and I think this links to something. We had a brief chat before the podcast and you shared with me about um, PwC's higher apprenticeship program. And I'll have to say, I was like, are you serious? This is what PwC is doing. I mean, I thought not only did you have to have tertiary education, but you had to have an MBA from the best business school. So you're obviously walking your talk in terms of diversity of your employees. Can you share a little bit more about that, Marcus? Sure. Um, so the, the, higher the higher apprenticeship program is geared around younger 
either students straight out of 12 or they might out of year 12 or they may have um, you know six to 12 months worth work experience um, who may not have thought of going to uni who may not have thought of uh, being able to afford to go to uni um, so what we do is we effectively uh, work with them on the job teach them the job four days a week and then for the fifth day they go in with um, an RTO uh, to do a diploma of technology. And so uh, what it does do, it, it brings us a fantastic amount of energy into the group, um, a desire for people to learn. But what it also does, it, it makes the existing um, people think about how they explain what's going on. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the thing about graduates is, <laughs> I, I love our graduates, they're fantastic. And they call, all come in with great ideas and great energy. And, and the reality is that the thing that you learn at uni is that you learn to learn. You may not know the exact skills that a job requires or the context in which it's used and, and all those sorts of things. So, but as a graduate, you can learn that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to create exactly the same environment for our higher apprenticeship um, teams where they're, they're working across different areas of the firm, they're learning how to apply different technologies to client problems, and they're learning on the job. So it's a, it's a fantastic program. It's been running for a number of years. Um, last year, we had a number of people that went through Diploma of Business. Uh, this year, we're focusing on technology, given the you know, transformation that, that the industry is going through, all our clients yeah. are going through. Um, we want to give those kids the same opportunities to learn, to apply, um, and just because they haven't been able to go to universities is not an impediment. So I think it's a fantastic learning environment for them. Oh, um, you treat absolutely. them like you would anybody else. Oh, no, I absolutely take take my hat off to you. So it's interesting. You were talking about earlier on about business speak and technical speak, and that you know it, it, we we have to to learn the language of our clients. And I'm just thinking, um, I, I suppose as a metaphor, we've got these young people coming in and they probably, they wouldn't know how to speak PWC. <laughs> and as part, I suppose as part of a, a practice or philosophy of enablement, how, what do you do to get them to feel safe, to speak up, to not think that you know, what they say might be stupid or ignorant or I, I, I don't know. It's because uh, in effect, you've got a sort of, I suppose, uh, different cultures coming together. I'm really curious to find out more about that. It's, it's a challenging issue. I mean, we are a complex organisation. We operate in different ways with different industries and, and different services that we provide. Uh, we do have a very strong coaching culture uh, right from you know, the top down where we do ensure that people have opportunity to voice those sorts of concerns and those issues and those challenges. You know, when, when somebody comes along, we appoint a buddy, uh, effectively somebody within their own team that they can just uh, reflect with what's going on here, how do we do that? Uh, you know, they'll have a formal manager who works with them on the tasks. Um, so it's, it's really about guiding and ensuring that they feel connected to mm -hmm. the people around them. And as a leader, the only thing you can do is ask the questions because that's where that openness comes from. How do you create trust between different people at different levels? And it's a, it's a big challenge because some people feel comfortable voicing their opinion and, and you'll find you know, the Gen Xs or, or baby boomers, Gen Xs, probably traditionally more command and control, yeah. whereas millennials... You know, anything goes. Uh, and they'll, they'll throw all sorts of questions to you where you think, well, where is that coming from? Uh, but you've got to be able to open yourself up, be authentic and say, okay, let, let me learn from you what you're trying to do and, and the context in which you operate. And that's an interesting challenge as a leader. You've got to open yourself up. You've got to listen. And don't assume you know the answer because yeah. there's some fantastic knowledge to be learned from all comers to the organisation. Absolutely. And, and I'm hearing more about uh, reverse mentoring in business, particularly in the area of technology where, you know, the millennials, the Gen Zs are 
uh, are so proficient. They've they've grown up with that. They're digital natives. Um, is there anything similar that happens at PwC? There is. So we do have opportunities for uh, uh, younger staff to to go and sit with partners, to go and sit with um, senior leaders, and help them adopt some of the latest technologies that are out there. Um, the good thing is we we have most of our people are very self sufficient. They'll go out and try things. I mean, what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is the consumerism of technology. Mm. You know, it used to be that people would get the best laptops and the best devices uh, in organisations. But what happens these days is you go and buy it from, from JB Hi-Fi or a, another shop um, and you end up with technologies that are generally much better than what you would get in an enterprise these days. Yeah. And so people are much more self-sufficient in... How does it work? What do I want it to do? Uh, how do I integrate it? Um, and how can I get the best value out of that tool, whatever mm-hmm. it might be? And so we're finding that people are much more self-sufficient. And I think that sort of traditional model about, you know, I don't know how these things work, how these things work, and I need somebody to help me, is diminishing significantly. Yeah. Quickly. And, yeah. and it's particularly around things like, you know, we're doing a lot of work with our clients around artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, statistical modeling around large data sets. Mm-hmm. And you need to understand how that all works. You can't rely on somebody to, to come in and show you. So yeah. you've got to get in, get your hands dirty, off you go, and, and make it work for you. Yeah, I could sit in one of those meetings, I think. <laughs> um, so back to back to the area of sort of enabling or, or enablement. If if we were to look at that, say as as a recipe, what would be the core ingredients? What what makes someone a great enabling leader? Um, <clears throat> the ability to, I think, put context around a challenge, around an issue. Uh, accountability breeds empowerment. So you need people to go out and do stuff and. So therefore, if you can paint, as a leader, paint the picture as to why something needs to be done and the context in which it's to be done, uh, people will just go off and do it. And I think that's really important, being able to paint that picture around why are we doing what we're doing, what's the context. Uh, You've got to be open, you've got to be transparent, and you've got to do so in a very human way. I couldn't couldn't agree with you more. And I suppose... One of my questions is because quite often, certainly in my experience of being in business and being managed in business, it was often the why that got forgotten. You know, we were strong on the what, we were strong on the how. But for me, if I didn't really understand the context, if I didn't really understand the why, then I'd struggle to make sense of something. So again, are you seeing a change in leadership where, to quote Simon Sinek, um, you do start with why? And, and it's a bit of a double question here is, what in your experience do you think stops leaders from embracing that, giving the context, giving the why, and being open and transparent? I've, I've listened and, and watched a lot of Simon Sinek's stuff as well. And uh, definitely being able to explain the why is really key. And the reason I think people don't is particularly new leaders or p- people appointed to leadership positions early in their career feel they need to know the answers. Mm. And so therefore aren't necessarily vulnerable to showing that they don't. Uh, you know, it's the concept of leadership being you know, all powerful. And the reality is, um, you need to have vulnerability. You need to tell people that if you don't know, you don't know, uh, and that you're seeking their input to actually come to a conclusion. And allowing people to see that really helps with that trust. Yeah, and I think you know, I call it courageous vulnerability because I think it does take courage as a leader to say I don't know, to be vulnerable and to have that culture of psychological safety for it to become embedded throughout, would you agree? Oh, very much so. Um, and it's the same, you know, you've got to own a problem. There's no point saying, well, we created this problem. I, either I did or I didn't. 
um, and you've got to own your issues. And I think calling that out is really important. Mm. Uh, but again, you know, it's it's what people feel comfortable with, and and more and more leaders today are very much more of that authenticity, vulnerability. Yeah. Than I think traditional leadership models that we used to have. Yeah. There might be an opening for you to work with the current government in Australia, Marcus. Anyway, we'll leave that aside. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. You know, it's uh, if you want to solve a problem, just shout louder. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm just going to, I want to go off on a, on a, a tangent slightly, um, because I see you, you know, you're heavily involved in community and I think, you, you know, it, cricket in particular and, and sport. And I recently, uh, was in conversation with, um, with Wayne Pierce, who was the, you know, former Balmain Tigers coach and New South Wales state of origin coach. And I, I Again, I'd like to understand or, or from your perspective, if you see there's any sort of correlation between sports performance and enabling, you know, is there a culture of enablement in, in sports coaching, in sports performance? And, and how can we, if there is, take those learnings from the field into the office? Interesting question. Um, there, there is a great alignment between what happens on a field or in a, in a sport versus what happens, happens in business. It's, it's the time difference is very different. You know, games, whether it's football or cricket or whatever it might be, has a defined outcome in a short period of time. Um, and as a coach, it's really about ensuring that people are aware that the players um, are aware of what's expected to get to a certain outcome and to help them identify where they might have skills gaps, where their approach might be. You know, not quite in line with what you're trying to do as a team. But at the end of the day, what happens on the field is determined by the players, not mm. by the coach. Right? I, I'm not there kicking the ball. I'm not there passing. I'm not there throwing, bowling the cricket ball. Uh, so all you can do is, is encourage people to participate and con contribute where they're very strong and allowing them to see where they add the benefit to the, the wider team. Um, which is no different to business, right? It might mm -hmm. be that you know, we're trying to get results on a particular project or a launch of a product or whatever it might be. And, and therefore, I have a role to play in that to make sure that the people around me are aware of what's expected of them uh, to make all that happen. Mm -hmm. now, the time frame might be six months, but the reality is that it's no different as a coach versus uh, a leader. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And again, expanding on your sort of community-based experience, um, I saw that you do you, you worked on a project. Was it in Uganda? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm um, on, on an advisory board for Australia for UNHCR, which is a charity that supports uh, a number of projects around the world. And I've been fortunate enough to. Um, to go to Uganda with them a number of times to look at some of those projects in action, uh, some that have been operating, uh, development of a high school, the technology centre, um, as well as turning the sods on a, on a new pro project for them. So, yes, I've been there a few times. Mm, and, uh, again, I, I'm curious, I um, spent a little bit of time in, in Kenya working on a project and foolishly thought, that I was helping them when it turned out to be completely the other way around. So, you know, what, what were some of the, what were some of the gifts that you got from working on your UNHCR programs? Um, I think when you go to, to places like refugee camps in Africa, you, you really get to appreciate what people will do to survive and how they will make uh, and try and, ensure they have a safe environment in which to exist and to, to move forward, not only for themselves, but for their families. And, you know, it, it's, in some ways, it's really encouraging watching people move on with their lives and, and do what they can do to ensure that, you know, whatever condition they came from, that, that they're much better off. And they seek to be self-sufficient as much as they can. And as you go, and, and visit the sites, 
um, it's challenging. You know, you want to get in and help, but the reality is, you know, people are very much geared around helping themselves. Yeah. With a small handout. Um, Uganda is an interesting uh, country where they have open borders on refugees. So, you know, they don't turn people away. They encourage participation in the communities. Um, so a lot of the uh, refugee camps uh, have a number of locals as well as um, refugees as part of the community. And, and people get on and, and rebuild their lives. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Have you got uh, anything coming up? Have you got any trips planned for in the future? Well, I'm, I'm hoping, um, I'm, I'm looking at running a fundraiser. Uh, Peter, you see, many years ago, 10 years ago now, when we had our 10th anniversary, we raised $10 million for education in Darfur. Wow. And we did that globally. Uh, yeah, it was a global global contribution. This year, uh, Australia for UNHCR has its 20th anniversary. Uh, so trying to do a reflection on how has that money made a difference to the local community. So seeking to raise some money in terms of taking a group of people back to Darfur, meet with some of the people that went through the education process and see how they feel about where they're at today and whether it's you know, the contributions that we're making in, in societies like ours are really helping uh, others who are in, in a much tougher position than we are. Oh, I think that's such an important thing. Yeah, you need to know, you know, you know whatever the outcomes are that, that you revisit that and understand. Um, I mean, I suppose like any any major project review, you know, where were the successes and where could we have done better? And just to experience that, that difference as well for your own um, sense of fulfillment. So you mentioned, Marcus, that you, one of your um, passions is, is lifelong learning. So what's, what's on the cards for you in terms of, I, I suspect you're similar to me when I was a manager and leader in business. It's never a box that you can tick off. You can't say, I've achieved that. It's, it's so aspirational. There's always something new to learn, uh, new areas to grow and develop. So what's the, the direction for you to continue to grow and develop as a leader? There are, there, there are multiple aspects to this. So, you know, any, any organisation that's going through transformation, which by definition is probably 90% of business in Australia today, yeah. you need to understand the context in which you work, the data that supports your decision-making, because uh, a lot of the transformation is data-driven. You're starting to apply real smart technologies real smart technologies to the problems. And as a leader, you need to understand how they apply. Um, so I've spent you know, quite a bit of time over the last year looking at the various technologies that are being applied at our clients, uh, whether that's how do you deal with artificial intelligence, what are the rules around it, what are the inherent biases that are being built into models, how do you question those. So it's not only the, the technical aspects of and, and you need to understand at a high level, not, not the detail. Mm. But you need to understand the ethics that you might want to apply to your challenges going forward uh, when you're using large-scale data. And, you, know, you see it with the large platforms where they're having issues. Um, the, the, the public domain uh, or the, the public challenges around the use of data is becoming much more important. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in, I think understanding how all that stuff fits together is important. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm as a leader, um, I'm continually interested in the, the behavioural aspects of, of teams and individuals. Yeah. Um, so, again, it's, it's read, it's learn. Uh, there are some fantastic platforms out there, you know, whether that's a, a Udemy.com or a, you know, some of the MOOCs that are out where you get free courses, you can look at what's out there or cheap courses, uh, you just go and do stuff. Um, Absolutely. It's interesting, actually. I was, um, I was speaking at an event last night for the Australian Institute of Training and Development, and, and we were being hosted by LinkedIn. And there's a new LinkedIn learning report coming out on the 4th of March. And that's 2020 for people listening a long way from now. Um, 
And it was very interesting. One of the, the new questions that they put into the report was around how what managers were learning influenced their people. And it was huge that um, team members were actively curious and interested in what courses their managers were doing. Um, if they could see any change in the manager, they would say, you know, uh, is it possible for me to do that course? That there was a really, really strong influence. Have you experienced that? Yeah, within the, um, the technology group within PwC, we, we have a platform that we've made available to everybody. They can, and within that, we've said, you know, by specific job roles, these are the, these are the skills and, and technologies you need to understand, and here are some courses online that you can do. Um, but for the rest of it, go wild. You know, if you yeah. want to do a course, you go and do a course. Um, so there's a lot of access to that. Now, a number of other groups have picked that up and said, look, can we have some licenses because we want our people to do the same thing. And it's just it's fascinating to watch people pick up and, and some of the courses that they're doing um, on their own bat uh, and off they go. You know, and, and I think it's really good to see people do that. Um, so when we do, when you run your normal report as to who's done what, mm. um, yeah, you might see you know, introductory Spanish. You go, well, okay, there's not much room for that in, in Australia today, but yeah, go for it. Yeah. Well, it's another so it's, example of enablement, isn't it? It's, a, it? it's in your culture. It's a culture of enablement too. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, people own their own careers. Um, as much as you'd, you'd like to think that you know, the organisation will look after me and, and my development, unless you know where you're going, you'll just get caught in the normal training regime of, of that job. But it's your career and, and we're very... You know, we work a lot with all of our people to make sure that they have their own development plans that consists of both professional development as well as personal development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where do they want to be in three to five years? Uh, it's, not, it's not up to me to define what their career looks like. It's up to them to, to work with us, say, well, these are the things that interest me and that's where I want to go. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and what adds real growth to people is, you know, that changes over time. What, what floated my boat 10 years ago is, is probably very different to what it does today. Yeah. And it's the same for everybody. So how do we give them those opportunities to work forward? And when these people leave PwC, they leave as, as fantastic brand ambassadors. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's uh, hopefully is, is the positive. But I think... You know, as individuals, you, you want to make sure. Um, we always have people who come and go, and I always celebrate people who leave, who go on to bigger and better jobs, mm -hmm. um, you, whether that's as a PwC brand ambassador, but hopefully it's for their own benefit. You know, they've gone on to, to grow. They've gone on to look yep. at bigger and better things for their own benefit. Very much so. So thinking about, again, coming back to this, core of enabling that you know you've mentioned about being being able to articulate the why being able to set the context and and make the complex simple for those people who are listening marcus who really want to understand more about this how do i become more of an, an enabling manager how do i help if it's a smaller organization how do i help develop a culture of enablement in my business what would be some of your sage advice? <laughs> I don't know whether it's sage advice or just, uh, <laughs> general advice. Active listening, I think, is key to, to leadership. Uh, being able to pick up on nuances of, about what people are saying, but also what people aren't saying. Um, you, know, you want people who challenge you. You want people who pick up on those on those finer points. So being able to listen to a conversation and, and pick out salient points is really important. So, you know, I think that's where you've got to start um, and tell people that you're listening. Um, yes. Yes. I. Um, it, it's interesting, actually. I, I can probably count on two hands and no more. The people whose presence I've been in 
where I felt completely and utterly listened to and completely and utterly present. And there is something so special about that that just, it, it, you know, boosts your sense of self-worth, self-esteem, uh, validation. And yeah, it's not, it, it's not so much a skill that we, I mean, gosh, if we could teach this from early age, how to actively listen, you know, in the education system, kids are just told to sit down and be quiet and listen. But how do we learn to listen? I think it's a critical point. Mm. Yeah, I, look, I don't know. I don't know how you teach people other than through doing. Mm. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of training courses on active listening, and, and no doubt, all many of the listeners will have gone through a number of these. Um, I think the challenge is you ask the question and you you don't say anything. You just leave it open. Yeah. And you let the conversation flow. And that's a challenge for a lot of leaders because they feel they need to fill the void. Mm. I'm staying quiet. <laughs> no, it's really important. And, and you know, as a natural, as a natural extrovert, I've really had to practice that. Really had to practice because I've wanted to fill the voids as well. And another one of my very annoying traits that I'm still working on and getting better at is not turning the topic of conversation back to myself my it, it's out of enthusiasm and positive intention um but the impact isn't uh, isn't very good <laughs> yeah, well you, you raise an interesting point because when, when you look at teams you, you will have extroverts you will have introverts um you know and there are a number of tools out there that help you define working styles and, and what best suits a team and a blend of team, blend of people. But they're just labels. But I think recognising them and at least having a common language within a team mm. as to how you address some of those is, is also key. So if we all speak the same language and at least we can relate to each other in the same way to, to be more open. You know, if I know that I've got a lot of introverts in my team, the way I conduct my meetings might be very different than if I have a lot of extroverts. Yeah. Um, and, and knowing what that makeup is, you can actually do a, a lot of work with. Mm. Yeah, no, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you. So, Marcus, is there anything else you want to leave us with that we haven't covered? Is there, a, is there a, a, something final you want to say? And then also, how? what's the best way for people to connect with you? I'll most certainly put... Um, the details of the book on the show notes and also a link to UNHCR. Um, anything else that you'd like to, to round us off on? Um, oh, in terms of contact points, uh, link, if you've spoken about LinkedIn, that's probably um, the key one these days. Uh, I am on LinkedIn, so please feel free uh, to reach out. Um, the final thought is don't take yourself too seriously. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. Mm. Um, and if you don't enjoy it for too long, go and do something else because life's too short. That's a great philosophy to end with. And I'll make sure that everything's um, written down because having that wonderful Dutch surname of Van Furcht, it's very hard for people to guess what the letters are made up of. I get called many things, Claire, so you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. <laughs> Marcus, it's been such a pleasure. Just, um, I've re I really have enjoyed listening to um, those golden nuggets, those pearls of wisdom around setting the why, the context, the testing assumptions, the active listening. Um, I think they're skills that you know, we'll never be able to tick the box off on and can always continue to develop. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Claire. It's my pleasure. Go well. <laughs>